Welcome everybody, Coach BK here with BK Coaching and R&B Do Nutrition. We are talking today about protein, okay? One of the first things that I tell the people that I work with regarding protein is that animal doesn't necessarily mean protein and plant doesn't necessarily mean carb, okay? There are many sources of protein that kind of go um, span the macro categories. So if we could take a step back for just a moment and kind of forget everything that we know just a bit about these macros, protein, fat, carbs, what's good, what's not, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And let's just look at the facts of kind of the science behind what protein does. And then we'll get into a little bit of the, the nitty gritty on the difference between animal sources and plant sources of protein. So um, protein is required. It is incredibly important, very critical. It is one of the macros and in the article provided, um, it, it, there's a picture that shows how much your body is water, how much of your body is fat and how much your body is protein, okay? So let's talk about what protein is. Protein is definitely a powerhouse macronutrient. Um, there's many things that it does. So it helps to create muscles, organs, nails, hair. It helps your cells to communicate. It facilitates muscle contraction. Um, helps in the transmission of nerve signals. Proteins make up um, immune molecules, blood cells, hormones, enzymes, um, aids in the production of new protein cells. So protein, what your body does with protein is critical. And that means that we need to maybe say less of the protein word and more of amino acid and think about what the body does when it breaks down, starts to digest and utilize protein, the different sources of protein. We really need to kind of broaden our thoughts on protein sources similar to carbs. So we know that the different col the different colors in the plant world do different things. So different sources of protein are similar. They're made up of different amino acids, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, protein is is super duper critical that you get enough, not too much. It's highly controversial. Are you supposed to be eating protein? Are you not supposed to be eating protein? Are you supposed to be vegetarian? Are you supposed to be a meat eater? Um, and so this article and this kind of real quick chat is gonna cover just kind of underneath all of those questions. Here's the science behind protein. If you choose to do it like this, here's the thoughts. If you choose to do it like this, here's the thoughts, okay? so. Go and reference the article. The article will be a link in the podcast notes. It's a long name, so I don't wanna say it. Um, and so I'm gonna kind of nutshell some of this stuff, but I'm gonna try to give you an idea of just how big and critical this, portion, this part is and that you get it right. So, <clears throat> and again, we're talking to athletes. So we are very interested in performance, being faster, healing faster. Um, getting to the race, not injured. Performance is exactly where we want it to be. Hitting our goals, um, being healthy. Though this conversation, everybody needs to know, um, hormone health is highly affected by um, the quality and how much protein you're getting. So we're gonna kind of touch on that as well. So in a nutshell, um, protein is made up of amino acids and there are 20 of them. The article referenced in the show notes are gonna have um, a picture and a guide to 20 amino acids. And so eight of them are essential. Your body makes up a lot of them, but eight of them are essential, meaning that <clears throat> you have to consume them with what you eat, your nutrition, you are fueling in order to do X, Y, and Z. Get up in the morning, blink, feed your kids, run a marathon, do an Ironman, etc. Okay. Um, and so there's this phrase complete proteins means that that protein source has a complete profile 
of protein. It's not missing any of the essential amino acids. Um, so animal protein is like this. Animal protein is also packaged with fat, which is an important um, delineation between plant-based proteins, but we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, so the eight essential amino acids, there are sources of plant-based complete proteins. However, again, later on in this chit chat, we're gonna talk about there are some thoughts that we need to consider on eating them. So what's a complete protein? Where can you get those? The other thing we're not thinking about strong enough is are you actually designed or able to absorb all of that protein and utilize it? This is a, a consideration that we need to think about in the plant world because of the nature of plants. And we'll get to that here in a little bit. Okay, so high quality protein. What are we talking about? Clean, high quality. We're talking about grass fed beef. Um, studies are now showing that it's not the red portion of red meat that is creating the cardiovascular health issues like that. Um, it's the fat composition. The fat that's coupled in with the protein is being shown to um, negatively impact health. So if you're wanting to kind of loosen up the idea that red meat is bad, you could go with the cleaner um, grass-fed beef, which is healthy for you. Um, and we can get into that in further detail. Um, as far as the fatty acids, we talked about if you go and listen to the fat conversation about the fatty acids and how grass-fed beef is higher in the short-chain fatty acids. Um, and that's what we're meaning by the fat composition, okay? So red meat being shown that might not be as unhealthy as previously stated um, in grass-fed beef is definitely in that direction. Um, Pasture-raised eggs are a really good source of complete protein. Wild-caught salmon, and then organic vegetables. And we'll go into later detail where the complete ones are at, what are the best ones to be eaten in the plant world, okay? So protein is an essential structure um, component of hormones and open up your mind a little bit to when we say hormones, we just don't mean the sex hormones. Your body, everything that you do is controlled, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, by hormones, um, however that is. So um, there's a lot more talk in the article about some things about how like blood sugar management is um, helped, aided, with um, consumption of protein. It's very interesting, like protein is digestion, digested and insulin acts as a gas pedal. Your glucagon in your body acts as a brake. And since protein doesn't have much sugar in it, um, if you're eating a lot of protein and not coupling that up with carbs, sometimes we can get hyperglycemia, the low um, blood sugar because you need sugar to put protein in the cells. And so the body is actually taking sugar out of the blood to put the protein in the cells. But then you get into this state where you have your blood sugar drops, um, hyperglycemia, and you know, folks that have experienced that know that it doesn't feel very good and it's not exactly um, you know, beneficial for health. So um, to slow insulin down, there's an amino acid in um, protein that helps insulin to stop stealing glucose out of the bloodstream. So the process is pretty interesting um, as long as all of these systems are working well. And that's something else um, for those of us that are a little bit older and have more wear and tear on the some of these systems. Um, we need to kind of recognize that while yes, this is how the body is designed, some of us aren't exactly in optimal state. So, um, you know, pre-diabetic, if you back up a little bit from that, you have insulin resistance, meaning you're not really managing the blood sugar all that great. Um, 
And so for those with insulin resistance, one day of protein only really helps um, to kind of balance this um, system out, the blood sugar management and whatnot. So it gets a little complex, um, and that might not have been the clearest example, but protein is really important for all of these systems to, to go on, and they interact with each other very closely. <clears throat> so our kind of our idea about the macros and that we can keep them separate and, you know, we can go totally low carb or we can do this or we can do that. Just know that for, and especially for athletes that are running a little low on things anyway, you need sugar, glucose in order to utilize protein. Um, so let's get down to the nitty gritty. <clears throat> How much protein do you actually need? Um, so <laughs> this is controversial. It's all over the place. Um, there's many, many, many books and whatnot. So I sign up for protein is good and that you need an adequate amount and low protein is certainly harmful. Um, I do follow the line that um, we do need to eat carbs as well. So um, let's just chat for a second about low protein diet. So that means less than 50 grams a day, okay? And again, remember, we're not talking about low animal. We're talking about low protein consumption, wherever you're getting your protein. So low protein diet, less than 50 grams a day, has been shown to um, decrease growth hormone, estrogen, thyroid hormones, insulin. Um, low protein diet um, stimulates the stress response, so that's not a good thing. Um, low estrogen, low growth hormone, low thyroid hormones, low insulin, all of that means that all of these things are low, um, so you're not able to do the things that you need to do. Um, and it has been shown that the low protein diet does increase body fat and fatty liver. So, just in a nutshell, um, and also, if you are interested in the medical sources for everything that I am saying, the article has all of the references in them at the bottom. So high protein diet, okay, getting too much protein um, can be damaging to the kidneys. It's very dehydrating um, to process protein, okay, and it's um, intensive on the kidneys. High protein diet has been shown to increase body fat, okay? And so how much do we need? For the non-athlete, um, they are saying roughly one gram of protein per kilogram of body weight. Good place to start. And if you're an athlete, um, this is where you work with a coach or do a little bit more investigation to figure out what you're doing, where your nutritional status is, what's gonna work best for you. Um, systems like, you know, metabolic efficiency is really good. Um, you know, trying to be very cognizant about getting a wide variety of protein sources and a wide variety of good, mostly vegetable carb plant sources as well. Um, so protein consumption is very unique per individual and it really just depends on um, where their tendencies are at. So some functional medicine people are doing DNA testing to pinpoint what type of person are you? Are you a fast burner, slow burner? What is best for you? Do you work best with more fat or more carbs? Um, are you a type of person that tends to be more anemic? All of these things, if you wanna get pretty sciencey about it, can dictate um, how much protein you need. But one gram per kilogram of body weight is a good place to start. And then obviously you're, if you're an athlete, runner, training, you need more, okay? Um, so moving on to a talk about plant proteins. Um, there are a lot of plant proteins um, that vary in amino acid composition and bioavailability. We've already talked about that. Um, your body, everybody's different a little bit on um, their ability to digest and process plant proteins and animal proteins as well. Um, the thing with plant proteins is that plants, um, <laughs> they, they, uh, they have 
particular defensive mechanisms that actually make um, digesting their protein difficult. And we'll talk about that more here in a little bit. Um, something that I didn't know until this year is just super duper interesting to me. So um, we just need to be thinking about two things, how clean it is, how available it is. Okay. So what are the best sources of plant proteins that are complete and highly bioavailable? So they have the whole amino acid profile and you can utilize them well. So spirulina, hemp, soy, quinoa, um, lentils, buckwheat, and amaranthin. Um, other plant proteins that, while they aren't complete, if put together with other sources of protein, um, are of value. Brown rice, peas, beans, chickpeas, tahini. And so, um, something to know about protein consumption. You don't need to fill every meal with a complete protein. Think about a complete amino acid profile throughout the whole day. So if you were just being mindful about the variety that you were getting and where you were getting it from, you really just need to focus on having one complete protein a day and you'd be good. You're getting those complete amino acids, those essential amino acids. You don't have to do it every meal. Okay. Let's talk about the benefits of plant proteins. Um, plant proteins are super awesome because while animal protein comes coupled with fat, and we've already talked about fat and how important fat is, go check out that video and that article on fat, the essential um, fatty acids. Um, plant proteins come packaged with carbohydrates, okay? And while that can be um, negative to some things, it, it's depending on that particular person and then how, you know, where they're getting it from. Um, carbohydrates offer phytonutrients, which is critical. Phytonutrients, um, plant nutrients, they do a whole host of things. Um, and so we'll talk about those here in just a, a really quick bit. Um, I can't say all of these words, so I'm just going to go through, I think maybe eight or just a couple of them. Read the article. Um, it goes through um, eight or nine different phytonutrient categories that serve huge purposes. Plant nutrients, they're super duper important. This is why some of us are kind of like, let's not go low carb, let's just go nutrient dense carb good amount of protein, good amount of carbs, and eat well um, because the plant world offers just a host of health benefits. So bioflavonoids are an antioxidant that protect the body against stress and they come from scissors, fruits, onions, um, tea, parsley, wine, soy, dark chocolate. Again, help the body combat stress. That's so critical because whether we're running or we're living or we're breathing or we're growing a human being, all of that is stress and we need to be mindful of counteracting that. Um, carotenoids come from the yellow and orange pigments and they're precursors to vitamin A, um, play a role in preventing some cancer, so carrots, sweet potatoes, tomatoes. Um, chlorophyll, green pigment, green pigment in all plants. Um, a component in vitamin A, C, E, K, as well as magnesium, iron, potassium, calcium, fatty acids. Um, this one's super cool. This nutrient helps to repair DNA and keep it from mutating, um, which may help prevent cancer. So see the plant nutrients are just super freaking awesome. Um, flavonoids help prevent um, cancer cells from creating new blood um, vessels. So not growing, um, reduces stress, so combats that stress response again. Um, preventing against ultraviolet radiation, reducing inflammation, protecting the heart, um, polyphenol, polyphenols, <laughs> tea, cinnamon, coffee, many fruits and vegetables. So you're kind of getting the idea that the fruits and vegetables provide it's like the oil in your car. So, you know, you're getting your protein and your fat. That's like your, um, that's like your gas you put in your car. But the, 
the phytonutrients are like the oil that you put in your car that keeps your engine running smooth and stuff like that. Um, there's just a whole slew of things and we're just kind of uh, scratching the surface on what the phytonutrients do. So when you're getting plant sources of protein, you're also getting the phytonutrients. Not better or worse than animal sources of protein, which is coupled with fat. You need all of these things. And so that's why we are saying get a wide variety from the animal world and the plant world optimally. If you're understanding what you get from the animal protein world and you choose to only go to the plant protein world, just understand that you'll have to, you know, do some other things because there are things that the plant world doesn't do as well as the animal-based protein. Okay, there is a downside to plant proteins. Okay, um, plant proteins, uh, we've already talked about it, come coupled with carbs. Um, I think a dog <laughs> is snoozing and whining, sorry. Um, so plant proteins come um, packaged with carbohydrates. Um, and too many carbohydrates in the diet can be inflammatory and cause blood sugar imbalances. So that's kind of where you need to just be mindful and be smart and, and stuff like that. Um, so in the plant world, plant protein, um, and generally in the plant world, plants are designed to have a defense mechanism to keep themselves from being eaten right or like from bugs so this is partly why new um organic plants are more nutrient dense because um they are allowed to fight against their environment and so they are richer in certain um phytonutrients however some of these phytonutrients they have actually called them anti-nutrients and they aren't all that great for you it is what it is. Um, these are called anti-nutrients that keep us from absorbing all of the nutrients in the plant and can cause side effects for people that are sensitive to them or have hormonal imbalances. So it, it is what it is, okay? Some people are gonna react to it or have um, bigger effects than others. Um, let's talk about some examples. And again, the article has a ton more of information examples on this. So. Um, phytic acid, phallic acid, no, phytic acid. I, I'm terrible. I'm a math person. I am not a reading person. Anyway, read the article. The spelling is correct in there. Um, primary storage component of phosphorus in plants. And what it does is it binds to minerals in the GI tract, okay, keeping them from being absorbed. So this can lower iron, zinc, calcium, and magnesium levels. So a phytonutrient, actually an anti-nutrient that you are consuming out of your fruits and vegetables binds with certain things in the GI tract. And once that happens, your body doesn't know what to do with it. So you don't absorb that. So that can cause lower levels of, like I said, the iron, zinc, calcium, magnesium. It all goes on kind of the chemical composition of everything. Um, it can also make it harder to digest proteins and fats by inhibiting digestive enzymes, okay? So this acid though does have a benefit of scavenging heavy metal, okay? So its um, properties that it does as an anti-nutrient hurts, can hurt you and can help you at the same time because, you know, now our soil is very, very um, inundated with heavy metals. So our fruits have a lot of heavy metals in them. That's another side effect, another downer of this plant-based protein is you get a lot of um, heavy metals out of your soil. The plants absorb it, but this um, acid actually binds with it. And then once it's bound with it, it'll go out the digestive tract. So, um, just kind of super duper interesting that we need to kind of understand that there's um, a light and a dark side to everything. And once we understand that and we're not, we detach the emotion and we're not so anti-animal or anti-plant or this or that, 
and kind of take a step back where you understand what the heck's going on. Um, there's a write-up about soy, about the controversy on soy. and um, So talk about lectins. This one's interesting, um, labeled as anti-nutrient. Um, present in high levels in legumes, leptins are able to bind or clump together red blood cells, which can cause um, blood clots in arteries, blood vessels in the lungs, um, smaller blood vessels in the GI tract. Very interesting, right? It's just chemical science. Um, they can also interfere with nutrient absorption in the intestines, um, and they may encourage um, growth, bacteria overgrowth in the um, GI tract. So we're talking about lectins, um, black beans, soybeans, lima beans, etc. Some um, grain products. Just super duper interesting, and we're not saying good or bad on any. It's just how it's designed. Um, so the the article that goes with it has you know talks a lot about more of these anti nutrients. There's um, eight of them in general. Um, there's some that, you know, like the nightshades that will affect um, thyroid function, um, et cetera, et cetera. You, you just have to be mindful of this, but then also understand um, some people will talk about um, goitrogens. So kale is heavy in goitrogens and this particular anti-nutrient um, makes it harder for the thyroid to absorb iodine because the comp they compete for iodine that gets into the gland. Um, and then it also weakens the activity of the enzyme thyroid, I can't say that word, um, required for the conversion of T4 and T3. So that's how it's designed, however, you would have to eat two pounds of kale a day to affect your thyroid health. So just be super duper mindful that, um, you know, there are pluses and minuses in everything. We just need to understand kind of the basics and then find the middle ground, do things that are common sense and um, that you can sustain, right? And so getting a wide variety of protein, at least one gram per kilogram of body weight to start off with, if not a bit more. Again, you know, ask someone a little, you know, look at the look at you as an individual to get, you know, more of a recommendation that's specific to you. I can do stuff like that. Rachel can do stuff like that. Um, you can learn that on your own as well. Um, but the basics is to get to understand that protein is vital, vital. It does so many different things, okay? You need it. You have to get enough of it. There's a huge debate on what is enough. So you have to make your own kind of call on that. But understand that that question is not, you know, doesn't go along with are you eating animal or are you eating plant? Okay, protein is protein, you need it. Do you get it from plant sources? Do you get it from animal sources? Do you get it from a mix of it? That's up to you, but you do need it and you do need adequate amounts of it because hormonal health can be devastated by not eating enough plant protein, or I'm sorry, not eating enough protein um, just in, in general. And so then, you know, athletically, if you want to perform better, um, you want to repair, you have to eat protein, you have to combine it, you have to do all of these different things. Okay, so that is kind of a nutshell on protein. The article goes along with it, gives you some um, more nitty gritty information. And if you want to go and go back and listen to some of these things I said, that would be great. So go look for the link on the show notes, or if you wanted to look at some of the resources where we pulled this information, you could gain a lot of information from that as well. Hope you're having a great day. Namaste.